Um, I'm not replacing Naveen. I, I can't replace Naveen. I don't know those of you who don't know Naveen. Um, he's a pediatrician. Uh, he was director of a hospital in India and also a research center. He was um, the CSO person on the Gavi board for many years. Um, he's a real doer. Unfortunately, he's got the flu. Um, I, I'm sure he was vaccinated, but you know, <laughs> vaccines don't, they're crappy, uh, especially that one. Um, it's a real shame he couldn't come, but we really thought it was worth sharing with you today this initiative with the IPO. So um, I want to first echo what Arnold said. I think we've got lots of things going on talking about the what, and it would be great if we can find a way of starting to really um, understand who's doing what, because I think we're coming at this interpersonal communication for healthcare providers. We're all arriving from slightly different directions. There are many common themes, et cetera. So that's, that's something I, I want to park for today. What I want to talk about today is the how. And um, for me, this touches, again, our theme of resilience. Um, <clears throat> there are going to be things that we will just need to do in every program in the world. Um, I think we're already getting an idea with the uh, Kids Boost Immunity that, you know, if any country is serious, they're going to be building confidence and, and, and demand in the early generations. But the other thing we know is if healthcare providers aren't, aren't, aren't on board, if they're not mobilized, if they're not equipped, if they're not galvanized to be getting out there and recommending vaccination, but I'm going to show you communicating way beyond uh, that space as well, then I don't see how any program can expect to have resilience. This is Naveen on the left. You can see, uh, well, you all know that guy in the, in the uh, shirt on your right. Um, that's Barbara Pahud. Um, but there's Naveen. So this was at um, a training uh, workshop that we had in Panama uh, in March. But I'm, there's no way I can fill his shoes. He is currently the executive director of the IPA. The IPA is an umbrella organization over 100 years old. Um, with 169 member societies from 150 countries almost. And so I think that an organisation like this um, uh, could play an extraordinary, a, potential, uh, a potentially impactful role in the implementation of the things that we've been hearing about today. And um, I want to show you what, where, where this is going, where we think we can go with the IPA um, starting right now. This is probably the ugliest slide I've ever made. <coughs> and there's, there's a, I've got another one that's animated, it's even worse. But you know, it's, it's important that we remember that um, people are hearing that they are within this communication ecology. There are, there are these interacting communication systems. They're hearing messages from different places. They need to hear consistent messages, obviously. They need to hear messages from trusted voices. And, uh, healthcare professionals are the trusted voice. I don't need to show you the data on that today. And uh, they, can be, they can be in different communications systems within this ecology. Um, I'm not going to, these are Naveen's slides. We know the critical role. We know it's not always easy. Um, uh, we know that they are the cornerstone of, of trust in vaccination. What I want to go straight to, because you've, you've already heard all of that, is the IPA Vaccine Trust Project. We deliberately changed the name to Trust. Um, a project that's aiming to, 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 to foster resilient trust, public trust in vaccination around the world. So it's a global initiative. The aim, as I've mentioned, is to equip and galvanize healthcare professionals to advocate for vaccination and to create resilient public health communications ecosystems. We want to engage and empower initially pediatricians by improving the, the effectiveness of their conversations with patients, but also providing them with other skills so that they can communicate in other channels, in other communication systems to the public. We have a number of other objectives. I think we'll I'm going to come back to some of these because they come through in the deliverables. So it gets uglier. We want, this is a training package <clears throat> that we hope that will, uh, will um, uh, be implemented or be available, made available through the IPA 
um, to national pediatrics associations, um, a package that will have different modules that I'll come to that can potentially provide training, um, capacity building for healthcare professionals to communicate directly um, with the public, with patients, to communicate with them through social media, to communicate with them through the media, and also to potentially advocate um, right to the top um, for, uh, for uh, vaccination programs. There are, um, in fact, six modules. Um, the first one is not well written here. It's just a base. What is vaccine hesitancy? What does the evidence tell us? We found uh, over and over that you've got to get people up to a common understanding of the problem. There are two modules on interpersonal communication that I'll come back to. There's a module on advocacy, a module on social media, and a module on mainstream media. <coughs> I don't want to talk about AIMS, uh, the AIMS methodology today, but uh, this uh, methodology that has been developed, uh, that we've developed with John, we're making fully available to the I, uh, IPA to, to roll out. Um, what's very, very important is this is a, this is a dialogue. It's a, it's a, it's a process that um, has been developed uh, it, it's science-based, it's not yet evidence-based, it's science-based, it's based on communication sciences, neuroscience, um, it's, it's uh, pulling together a lot of evidence about how we interact with each other, the impact that our interactions, our communications have on our, on our, uh, our understanding, on our, on our biology, literally, but I don't want to get into that today. Um, but what it is, except, except just to note that um, we will be um, hoping to have some evidence for it. So we've got two studies coming up, one in, uh, in residence, uh, working with Dr. Gary Marshall in Kentucky. And we've got another um, uh, study that we'll be doing. We've moved this to an online module. We've also got an online module. I agree with Noel. I don't think that online is the solution, but it's a way of starting to get out there. I think that any of these training processes, appro um, approaches for IPC uh, are, are, are a process. You don't become good at something overnight. We need to imagine that we are providing ongoing training, ongoing support in the long term, I think, to, to enable people to literally change their own behaviours so that they can communicate more effectively with people. Um, and so the second trial will be in, um, we're hoping to have a sample of around 2,500 uh, primarily pharmacists uh, using that online module. So. That's, that's uh, stay tuned, but um, we're finally getting to a point where we can start testing this. But what's important is that there is a, it's a fully, it's a, it's a full package. We have, we have modules, we have pre-reads, we have materials that, that can then be taken. We have a facilitator guide, facilitator guide and evaluation module and that online module. Um, I think another point about this, um, this module which applies to everything that we're developing with the, with the, that the IPA is developing is that these are um, very much generic modules that then need to be adapted to country context. So we haven't started by you know, going in really understanding um, a specific population. What we want to do is provide uh, something that is as grounded in the evidence, in the science as possible, but then um, needs to be taken to the country level, taken to right down to the, the community level and adapted accordingly. <coughs> The second um, interpersonal communication module is a module from UNICEF that was recently um, completed. And so the IPA wants to, uh, has, has offered also to, to provide support to enable, um, so to, they've endorsed the package and they're, they're, they're also, they want to provide support in the rollout of this package, in the training of trainers, um, in monitoring and evaluation, etc. This package is primarily focused on frontline uh, health workers. <clears throat> the, the third module is social media. So social media is um, scary as with, as with um, interpersonal communication. There is a, uh, a degree of behavior change that you need to affect in the people who do the training before you can get them to a point where they're effective. There is a very high level of social media hesitancy. So we've, um, we're working to develop um, a package uh, with, for the IPA right now. I'm working with a team in Brussels on a 101, how do you dip your toes in the pool, what is it like, um, you know, how do you just get someone to take their shoes off and, and literally put their feet in the pool. We're also um, going to take what's a lot of what Todd's developed so that there's an there's a 
advanced module. How do I how do I manage attacks? Um, how do I you know how do I um, uh, build in my risk uh, risk preparedness so that when I'm really out there uh, swimming in the pool or swimming in the ocean, um, you know, I've got my floaties on. Uh, there's also a vaccines uh, disinformation narrative that we've developed that we want to put in there that would allow these um, the trainees to then go and talk about vaccination, uh, vaccine disinformation in their countries. Again, all of this is fully adaptable. I wanted to just show one piece of that middle module because, uh, because of the conversation we had. Um, but I, again, I don't want to get into too much detail. Um, it doesn't only say, it doesn't only give um, a background to what vaccine confidence is and to what we understand uh, based on the current science about the impact of misinformation and what I believe is far more important, disinformation, deliberately created uh, misinformation, which is uh, usually created with uh, underlying motives. Um, not only what do we understand about that, moving people past their assumptions to what does the science tell us now, it's not the, we, we, I don't think we still know whether it's what impact it's having really on people's behaviours, um, but it's important that uh, the, thinking, the thinking of those out there who are dealing with this, who are tackling this, it should be evidence grounded. But what we also put in this module is how do you inoculate against misinformation? And we have, there is science around this. So we had uh, Stephen Lewandowski last year show us uh, work that he's done on how you can inoculate people against myths, against misinformation. We have um, other tactics that can be taken. You can highlight the tactics that people are using. Um, we had a workshop last year here from the, from the WHO, the Vocal Vaccine Deniers Workshop that um, has, has, you know, captured the different um, tactics that are used. You can also challenge, and, and I don't, I'm not quite sure why we're not doing this more, well, not we, but you know, media and else, others, the credibility of, the, of those who are uh, creating and disseminating disinformation. If you, uh, I mean, this is, this is uh, Aristotle's ethos within, within uh, the model that he have, has, logos, pathos, Ethos. There's a lot of science behind this. This is epistemic trust. How do we how do we <laughs> develop our knowledge? We have to trust the source. If we undermine that, then maybe that's a way of inoculation. I'm not sure that this has been proven yet, but I think it's potential. Um, I can see three common hidden agendas. Um, it's used to monetize. It's used to politicize. And as we've seen uh, with the with uh, the impact of what Russia was doing, it can be used to polarize societies. Um, I think that this kind of module put out there can help healthcare professionals to get into the conversation about the challenges we have and start to change people's thinking. Well, enough of that. There's then a module on how to engage with the media. Um, so this is being developed by um, uh, Global Health Strategies and, um, and, 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 and Johns Hopkins University. Um, we don't have the module yet, the, the two trainings are being given and so we're hoping to, this is where we will actually potentially package in, hopefully we need to, uh, that, well the IPA needs to work with the WHO but the, the vocal vaccine denies, but also a general module on, you know, how do I start to interact with the media? These are trusted, powerful voices um, and, uh, but communicating in these different channels take skills, okay, and, and our aim here, the aim of the IPA is to provide that capacity, that training um, <clears throat> to those who want it. The IPA also wants to take, I mean, wants to um, implement a full monitoring and evaluation plan, and what's not here really also is that um, the IPA sees its role also as, as providing support to the countries in um, implementation, so training of trainers, um, in uh, adaptation, how do you take these modules and start to put them in a, you know, in a form that is going to make sense. Um, uh, so there's, there's, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for an organisation like that to provide this kind of global support, but obviously this needs to be uh, driven down to the countries and owned by the countries. Uh, we've held two workshops um, just to see the interest to see uh, what we have, uh, does it make sense? Again, we've only really got one well-baked package at the moment, the AIMS package, but we're working hard to get the other ones, and now the IPCI, um, but we're working hard to get them. But we've, uh, we've already trained um, uh, almost 100 uh, paediatricians from almost 40 countries. 
Uh, we've got uh, some qualitative feedback from them. There was, it was not really possible to, to evaluate because you know, the, we weren't giving them real modules, et cetera. This was really just to start to get a feel for, is there an interest in this? But what's really important, we had people from um, countries all around the world, from all, all different corners of the world. Um, and the aim of the IPA is to provide something that can be taken by almost any country in the world and uh, adapted and implemented. So we did have some good feedback from the workshops, um, but you know, it's not that reliable because of, because of the way this was done. Um, the idea is also that the IPA would provide uh, support for the development of a global community of practice um, so to allow, as implementation starts to happen in different countries, cross-fertilization, sharing of best practices, um, cross-fertilization between the trainers, between the trainees, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think that um, communities of practice are not easy to build, but they're incredibly powerful. Um, I feel like I'm standing in one today, um, and I think that the IPA has an interesting opportunity to, um, I think they're aware that, that this could provide um, a real additional support. Um, there's, uh, we now have a draft, so this is the team. Um, there's the team from the IPA, there's an advisory group, there's also folks that um, will be advisors for different modules. We'll have regional coordinators and a secretariat. Um, there's a draft governance so that, you know, it's, this is starting to come together um, in a, in a, in a well-functioning uh, model. Um, and so where we're up to now is um, the IPA needs support, okay? The IPA can't do this on their own. They have no budget. And so right now, this is, this, this is really coming together. I think that it's an extraordinary vehicle uh, through which we can start to um, build capacity in countries, the capacity that we keep hearing we need. Um, the IP, and so the IPA is seeking partners. <laughs> and I think if there's one message to leave with you from, from Naveen today, as of uh, only a couple of weeks ago, they're seeking partners. They want others to get on board. This should be a, this is, we hope that this will be a broad collaboration um, with many partners on board, but with the IPA at the helm, um, you know, really leveraging its extraordinary global reach to help cascade these tools into countries. And I think this is also potentially an interesting model for the, for the cascading of other tools that are developed. And the last point I think that uh, I want to leave you with is, um, uh, again, uh, looking forward to resilience, uh, partnership is fundamental. We hear it, but we don't see it often enough. Um, partnership doesn't just mean working together. It means different organizations, different sectors taking leadership roles as well, not leaving it all to, 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 to national health authorities to do the job. And here I think it's a great example of uh, the, what a medical society um, can potentially, uh, the role that a medical society can potentially play in uh, addressing this broader problem and hopefully building resilient trust over the long term. Thank you.